I spoke here two years ago, and it would have fit in a shoebox. I'm so happy to see this conference expand like it has. What an honor to speak to the, the North American Bitcoin Conference again. Uh, I warn you, I'm by the way, in case you can't read the hat, it's not the, uh, it's make Bitcoin great again. <laughs> Don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> and in case you can't read the shirt, it's Dirty Hippie. I warn you, I'm a, uh, I used to teach philosophy, and I'm reminded of this story about a guy flying to Miami on a plane, sees this woman next to him, can't help but notice she's got this enormous diamond ring on her finger. Just that, he said, my gosh, madam, that is the largest diamond I've ever seen, the most beautiful diamond I've ever seen. She says, oi, this, this, this is the famous Klopfeld diamond, the world famous Klopfeld diamond. And he says, the Klopfeld diamond, never heard of it, but it's something. She says, oh, yes, yes, but it, it comes with the Klopfeld curse. And he says, the Klopfeld curse, what's that? She says, Mr. Klopfeld. <laughs> well, when you invite a philosopher to come talk to you, I warn you, you may get some philosophy along the way, but... Uh, who am I? If you don't me, I'm, I'm what Wired Magazine called several years ago the Messiah, well, the scourge of Wall Street and the Messiah of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not sure about the Messiah of Bitcoin, scourge of Wall Street, the shoe fits. Uh, when I was here two years ago, I, I walked through a number of issues with Wall Street that I thought uh, blockchain could fix, and I pointed out to, to the crowd then that the simplest solution, the simplest way to fix Wall Street, sometimes there are problems that are of such a sort, the simplest way to fix them is to drag Wall Street behind the barn and kill it with an ax, <laughs> and recreate it on blockchain in a way where the various grifts were not available. I'm going to walk you through one of those, and I direct you, incidentally, I'm under, I'll warn you, I'm under all kinds of legal constraints today, and all the reasons aren't going to be obvious, but there's lawyers pulling me in six different directions about what I can and can't say, so I'm going to, if there's any questions about anything I say, look to the Q3 earnings call transcript. I've been directed to direct, okay. Uh, let me show you what I mean. In August of this year, six pension funds filed what I think may be the first trillion dollar lawsuit in America. They filed... Uh, against the six major prime brokers on Wall Street, realizing that they've been ripped off for a couple decades. And as a result of this, pension funds in America are cracking. There's a New York Teamsters pension becomes first to run out of money. Experts warn of pension tsunami. If you don't know it, firemen funds, teach firemen, teachers, cops, all these government pension funds are cracking around the country. I'm going to tell you why, and it's connected to this fact. This was on October 23rd of 2008, when Alan Greenspan, when the world was melting down, Alan Greenspan was called out of retirement by Congress to come and explain what the heck is going on. And he said this sentence that's been misunderstood or aspects have been overlooked. Ah, no sound. Well, there are additional regulatory changes the that this breakdown of the central pillar of competitive markets are to stability particularly in the areas of fraud, settlement, and securitization. Well, the left jumped on this and said, ah, oh, you see, Alan Greenspan see, says markets even, even, mark, uh, even Greenspan says markets need government in order to work. And of course, fraud was things like Bernie Madoff, securitization, mortgage-backed securities. This settlement thing has been whitewashed out of history. What happened September 15, 2008 was a settlement crisis. The major banks didn't know who could, they could accept as counterparty. Why that happened uh, is connected to this fact. And now I'm about to draw all these facts together, but just stick with me for one more data point. I got in a very famous fight with Wall Street 10 years ago, and in the course of that Wall Street, that fight, I spent 20 or 30 million dollars on discovery. And we got a document. This document cost me 30 million dollars to get, what I'm about to show you. It's from Goldman Sachs, my old friends. Uh, Goldman and I have a long history. Uh, and the secret w is, this is the big secret of Goldman Sachs, 75% of America's prime brokerage revenue and 51% of global revenue comes from an activity that almost no one knows anything about. It's called securities lending. 
75% of the revenue, I think it's over 100% of their profit, of Goldman Sachs, prime brokerage. Uh, and by the way, I think this is true for all the six big primes. This is what securities lending is. You've probably heard of short selling. You get told that short selling is where a short seller borrows stock and sells it. It's not actually true. What happens is a pension fund, let's say they custody with a prime broker. And the prime broker, let's say Lumber Liquidators was a big short sell in recent years. Lumber Liquidators wants to, uh, a short seller wants to short sell. They, they find out the prime broker that it is available to short sell. They locate it. They don't actually borrow it. They locate it, which I represent as a little bullseye. And let's say they pay $20 for that privilege. That's how it's supposed to work. How it really turned out to be working a decade ago was there was very little to keep that prime broker once he realized he could get $20 from one short seller to keep him from telling other short sellers, hey, you're good for locates too, you're good for locates, you can go ahead and short sell, and charging each of them $20. Believe it or not, the bookkeeping back at the prime brokers is non-existent. There's a recording exists of an SEC official scolding in a sort of private uh, forum, private-ish forum, some senior officials of two of the big primes saying, hey, come on, and this was in front of a small audience of Wall Street insiders, saying, come on, work with us. We do these audits on your locate trails, and we're supposed, you're supposed to be recording whose stock you're, lo you're locating. Your guys are writing Mickey Mouse or three dots or something. There's no record keeping at all. So there's really very little to keep them from over-locating. <clears throat> and there's other different kinds of meshigas, other different kinds of games that goes on. Somewhere around a decade ago, the, the pension funds got smart and started saying, well, if you're going to make $20 loaning my stock out, give me 30%. Give me six of it. So there have been various court cases that show what the prime brokers do is you find an intermediate prime broker that you loan the stock to, instead charging, say, $2, $2 comes back, you give 30% of $2 up so the pension fund only sees 60 cents instead of $6. And then the locate goes on to another guy who pays the 20. And then there's this game played in the overnight repo market where the, the winnings get split up. So they cheat the pension funds once again. That is why, you know, it is because of this kind of meshigus, this craziness creates more stock in the system than has actually ever been issued. It's because of that that on 2008, October 23rd, Alan Greenspan is explaining to Congress this is a settlement crisis. There was more trillions more stock in the system than anyone could account for, it was, and the system froze. It was a settlement crisis. Uh, it's also, oh, here's a way to fix it. T0 has built some, so one of our sub blockchain subsidiaries, we have a, Overstock built a, a subsidiary called Medici to invest in blockchain four years ago. And one of our 11 investments is T0. And T0, among its many products that it is bringing to market, it has brought in the last couple months this to market, it's a software that replaces that role of the prime broker. And the software gets licensed to a broker dealer who takes custody, auctions off these locates. What you're doing is you're collapsing. Let's say the market collapses to 10, because now it's not opaque. Of that 10, eight goes back to the pension fund, $2 get, gets for, you know, for our trouble. That Wall Street exists on keeping markets opaque. Anytime they've taken, anytime something goes from over the counter, and over the counter means, hey, it's a hedge fund calling up three different primes saying, what rate will you give me to borrow lumber liquidators today? And instead goes to exchange traded, a nice auction, about 80% of the margin collapses on Wall Street. So what we think this is going to do is going to make happy the short sellers who get the locates, honest locates, for 10 bucks instead of 20. It's going to make the pension funds really happy. I think it's a way we can break the pension fund crisis. In fact, there was a, an analysis that what's, the pension funds are going broke because they've been assuming a 7% actuarial assumption and the truth should have been a four. Well, that missing 3% is about the revenue that comes out of this game and gets turned into 75% of the revenue of Goldman Sachs. If what we can do is get the pension funds to adopt this technology, which I think shouldn't be too hard to sell, 
what it effectively does is replumbs that pipe. So instead of being 75% of their revenue, it gets, goes back to the pension funds where it's about a missing 25 to 3%. It could solve the pension fund crisis. Of course, we make it so everybody's happy. Almost everybody's happy. Uh, you could, uh, but these things are all connected. The pension fund crisis, this lawsuit, the cause is all related to this sort of grift that's in the system that gets turned into 75% of the revenue of Goldman Sachs Prime Brokerage. That's why the pension funds are suing, and that's why they're breaking, because they've been losing 25 to 3% per year to this game without knowing it. Now let me talk to you about a different application of blockchain that's really important. Oh, by the way, I'm because of all kinds of things T0 is in the middle of, uh, I can't say more than that. And Overstock's in the middle of, I can't say more than that, but there's a lot of, other than there's a lot of other products T0 is introducing that sort of connects the world of fix of national market system, fix compliance, the, the, the financial system as we know it, with the world of blockchain. And there's a lot of connections to be made there. And uh, T0, uh, we four years ago sort of bought a node of Wall Street and started blockchainify, blockchainizing it for three or four years ago for this reason. Because we want to be, basically there's the conventional world, there's this new world of blockchain, the new universe of blockchain. We want to be the wormhole that connects those two universes. That's T0. Now let me mention something I'm really excited about. I think that we have the solution to global poverty sitting in front of us. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, there's seven and a half billion people on Earth. Two and a half billion live in the world as we know it. Five billion live in an unglobalized world. There's this famous Peruvian economist named Hernando de Soto. And de Soto figured out many years ago that uh, his great contribution is, in fact, he's, uh, is that these five billion people, while they live outside the world of legal rights as we know it, they already have informal social compacts governing the way they, they live. Uh, Hernando, well, let me walk through what we're going to this this argument. These five billion people do own assets, and from cows in Tanzania, which are branded. You know, every single one is branded to Egypt, to, you know, the Peruvian forest, to Afghanistan. Believe it or not, there are informal contracts covering everything. Uh, what, <clears throat> I'll give you the quick, I'll skip the slides. I'll just give you the quick rundown on this. What Hernando de Soto did was in the 1980s, there was a Maoist guerrilla movement called the Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso. And it was like, it was like Khmer Rouge. They had butchered about 70,000 people. We, the U.S., considered it the largest security risk in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they had taken 60% of Peru, and this economist had this idea. And a good way to think of it is what happened in the United States in 1849, when we had the gold rush. We had, uh, there were 850 mining camps around California. And every mining camp had, they come up with, even these miners, you know, come up with a set of rules. If you want to stake a claim, you, you draw it on a map, make your mark, and you nail it on that tree. And we all agree that tree in this little creek, that tree is going to be the keeper of the records. And then that evolves into some old guy, maybe he's injured or something, he becomes the ledger keeper. And that's how the gold happened all across California, the gold rush. When the judges and the lawyers show up 10 years later, they knit all that together into the state law of California. And there's this wonderful line from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, the Supreme Court Justice, who said, great law is discovered, not made. So it isn't made from the top down, it's discovered from the, from the bottom up. It's compacts and arrangements that are there and get revealed. Well, that happened in California. Hernando did that for Peru. With the government's permission, they went out and got millions of farmers to surrender these informal ledgers, and Hernando go, he calls this Indiana, his Indiana Jones period, and he'd go back with these nice government certificates and such, and everybody switched sides. And in six months, this terrorist movement collapsed. And in fact, the leaders turned themselves in demanding protection from the people, because they had been you know, doing such horrible things. So Hernando, uh, and then this funny thing happened, Peru blossomed. Once people got property rights, 
uh, Peru has been really like the miracle economy in Latin America. So I'm going to flip through a few more of these quickly. Because people do not have, generally, in the third world, they don't have title to their land, you know, you may have been living in some shanty in some favela outside Rio de Janeiro, and your grandfather lived there. And there's no question in your neighborhood who owns it. But you don't have a piece of paper, and you never know if the local generalissimo is going to show up and say, Senor, you thought that was your grandfather's land, this whole hillside, my grandfather's land, and you get taken from you. So nobody has an incentive to improve, and importantly, nobody has an incentive to, or nobody has a way to take a piece of paper to the bank and borrow a bit of money and start a shop, and start an entrepreneurial business. And one thing, I spent years of my youth in Asia, floating around Asia, and one thing I always remarked on in the developing world is how many entrepreneurs there are. They're everywhere. They're the guys who are buying watermelons on one side of town for two quai a piece and taking them in a wheelbarrow to the other side and selling for three. They're, all, they're everywhere looking for, but they don't have capital. They don't have capital because they don't, and Hernando traced back the great development of Britain and the United States came when we got capital right. Well, if you're in a place like Haiti or Guatemala, and you've been living in one of these places for years and you try to get title, it literally can take you 30 years and 217 steps. And that means 217 petty bureaucrats who you got to pay off. And it essentially doesn't happen. This leads to lots of problems. Terrorism. Turns out another of his great discoveries is all kinds of things, you know, from Shining Path to FARC and Al-Qaeda and ISIS. What ISIS does, when they roll into a town, they're very, well, when they were rolling into towns, they're very systematic, and they've got DMV on a laptop, and they've got identification, and they have, they go around everybody and say, show us your certificate of occupancy, and will you support us? And if you do, they put their stamp on it, and if you don't, you're kind of, the, you know, they may not touch you, but the other people may show up someday. So it's a real, it turns out to be really one of the main products that terrorist groups have to sell in these hinterland areas is show us your title and we'll defend your ledger. Uh, it's of course the Arab Spring, the guy was easy in Tunisia who set himself on fire. Uh, it turned out that within two months of him doing that, about 63 other people did, 37 of them lived. Hernando went and interviewed a bunch of them. There's a PBS show, Unlikely Heroes of the Arab Spring that you see play all the time. Turns out none of these people were extremists. None of them were None of them were extremists. They were all entrepreneurs. And they all were complaining about their, their capital being expropriated. And that's what fueled the Arab Revolution that millions of people took to the street to. They're tired of not having a rule of law. Uh, of course, when you don't have title, you get environmental damage, tragedy of the commons. Uh, we have this problem going on in, uh, in Europe now, just the mass refugee crisis. If instead we were able to surface these global ledgers, all kinds of things would happen. People switch sides, capital is unleashed. This happened incidentally in Japan, which is what MacArthur did in Japan after, the, uh, after World War II. He took all this feudal land titling arrangements and turned it into real title. It happened in Peru. The last time the West won a war against terrorism is when they did this in Peru. What Hernando did is basically what I described happened in the California gold rush and in the decades after that. Hernando did that in Peru, and everybody they switched sides, and within six months, this terrorist movement collapsed. Uh, it also liberated the Peruvian economy. Uh, lots of small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, Peru's gone on, grows up to sort of 9% per year. It's the great, it's the Peruvian miracle for Latin America. So, we think, and there's all kinds of support. This fellow, by the way, has uh, been nominated three times. It's kind of a sho shocking to me, he hasn't won the Nobel. He's been written about as one of the 12 most e important economists in history. He's been nominated three times for the Nobel Prize. He won the first Milton Friedman Prize. Milton Friedman was a friend of mine, and I was there that night. And of course, Milton was associated, in, maybe incorrectly, with the right. And or those words don't mean so much anymore. But 
Uh, since then, though, Bono and the Clinton Global Initiative and the World Bank and across the spectrum, people have recognized that this is the answer to poverty. I'm really, I've never seen an idea, and I used to work in development economics, I've never seen an idea which has such universal respect as his idea. Uh, the problem is how do you implement it? It's really tough to implement. Well, what you need is what you need is a company. What he's learned is he did this around Peru in meetings like you see on the left. I mentioned this all, by the way. Uh, this guy who I think has the answer to global poverty uh, is here with us. I don't know where he is, but Hernando, Hernando de Soto happens to be visiting us. Hernando, you call out. Hey. So uh, there's, a, there's a way to do this, and I, uh, my, and I want to thank my friend Gabriel Abed, who ran into Hernando somewhere six months ago and said, four years ago I was on a stage talking about Bitcoin. I said, I don't have time to do this myself. I'm going to take Bitcoin to Wall Street. Someone needs to take, read this book by Hernando de Soto and go implement it. I was kind of surprised three years later it hadn't been done. I heard he was available this in, I went down to Peru. We've had a buddy-buddy movie for about five months, and we've gone into business because we realize that through digital marketing, social media, mobile apps, and blockchain, we can implement his vision globally in five years. And we just recently announced this, like two weeks ago, uh, and we're pretty good. Overstock has to be, happens to be really good at digital marketing and social media and apps. Our apps have just won for the six year, I know it's not curing cancer, it's not, but our app, our mobile retail app, just won for the six year in a row the best retail app on iOS and Android. Well, that's the team that's gonna be building Hernando de Soto's app. I've, I've announced, I think that the next five years, my, I'm refocusing my whole life around implementing this guy's vision. Five years, we think we can lift five billion people out of poverty or at least, lay the rungs for it. Well, uh, I was going to go on and give you some philosophy, but I see I only have eight minutes left and I have to save three minutes for something special at the end. So I'm gonna give you the, the short course in philosophy. I did a PhD in philosophy. I spent years doing it, so you don't have to, okay? But if you want, I can summarize in four minutes Western philosophy and why Bitcoin is this huge event philosophically for our tradition. I'll leave out the, a bunch of the slides. Our tradition is the liberal tradition. Liberalism is a word that has been misused for about 80 years. Our tradition, the, which, of which Bitcoin, liberalism, the correct meaning is what people would now call classical liberalism or even libertarianism, or if you believe in the Constitution, things like that. I see our tradition as going back to the book of Daniel. And I'm not a Bible thumper, don't worry. But this is a, Daniel says to Belshazzar, you've been judged in the balance and found wanting. That is the so-called passion of the Western mind. The idea that there is some value that transcends political power. That political strength, you know, until then, Political strength and divine strength were the same thing, embodied in the same God King or whatever. This is the first time in intellectual history people came to see it as differently, that there is some balance in which you can judge political authority. And that has led to this fantastic tradition of limited government. The Greeks discovering voting and sortition, which we don't use enough of, by the way. Sortition, there was one stable period in Athenian democracy. 93 years, no problems. It's the one period where they chose their elector, their senators by random. Sortition is how we choose juries. That's sortition. Uh, and it worked. And the reason it works is it breaks up what happens when you don't have sort of, it breaks up capture. Well, some other day when you want to hear a bunch of philosophy, I'll come back and give it to you. But the, the, the point is, uh, we have this wonderful tradition running, of course, from the Greeks and Romans, the English, through the Spanish who don't get, oh, incidentally, who here, anyone here thinks of themselves as an Austrian economist or is into Austrian economics? Raise your hand. Good for you, good for you. Well, just so you know, 
what really happened is in Spain over 400 years ago at the University of Salamanca, there was a group of people called scholastics, and they figured out all kinds of stuff that, that they figured out, uh, they saw the money f coming in from the new world and how it created inflation. They figured out the sound, th uh, sound money, the relation between quantity of money and inflation, subjective theory of value, all kinds of things they figured out, migrated to the eastern edge of the Spanish Empire, which was called the eastern edge, is Österreich in German, Österreich, the eastern reign, the Österreich or Austria. Austria was the eastern edge of Spain back then. We Americans forget that Europe was basically Spain with, the, with one island of France floating in it. And it hibernated there for 200 years and it came out as what we call the Austrian School of Economics. The Austrian School of Economics' roots are actually back in Spain. And of course the Dutch. Anyway, I'll come back some other time and tell you the whole real intellectual history of where we are. It all culminates in the U.S. Constitution. I think the U.S. Constitution, all, every, every part of the U.S. Constitution, I can sort of trace the intellectual history back to one of these different figures I've been skipping through. The problem is there's discontents, and the discontents are we create institutions. We create institutions uh, so we can accomplish certain ends of ours, and those institutions end up getting captured. In fact, even Madison in Federalist Number 10 he warned us, he says, the valuable improvements made by the American constitutions on the popular models, ancient and modern, cannot be too much admired, but we shouldn't contend that they, have, they haven't solved the danger as much as we hoped. Uh, he's referring to capture, what we now would call capture or special interests and so forth. This is what democracies and republics perish on, because uh, our institutions don't stay sound. They, they, don't, they get captured. And I'm just going to skip through. The, the answer to all of this is blockchain. Because for the first time, <laughs> the answer to all of this is blockchain because for 6,000 years, as we've engaged in consensual exchange, we've had to rely on trusted third parties. I'm selling you a camel, you're giving me a gold coin. I don't know if I can trust your gold coin to debase it or not. So there's a business model. A guy creates a mint. The guy who has monopoly on violence in a territory creates a mint, puts his face on it. If you debase that, I kill you. It's a way, it's a way to, mon it's a business model, a way to monetize his monopoly on violence. All kinds of institutions that have been created for 6,000 years have that basic business model. You can't trust me, I can't trust you if we're strangers, so we each just trust a land titling office. We each just trust a mint. We trust a Visa card company. Uh, so a lot of these are public, are you know, these institutions, some are government, some are private. They have accumulated on the hull of civilization for 6,000 years. We now have, for the first time in 6,000 years, we have a way to have consensual exchange that's trustworthy without a third party. That is at its DNA, at the genetic level, why this is so revolutionary. We're going to disrupt institutions that have been binding civilization together for thousands of years. So with that, as, uh, I'll close on that note with the, with the exception of there's a, uh, an introduction I'd like to make. There's some people, well, it's a piece of good news last night, some people I'd like to ask join me on the stage, led by Steve Nuryev of Alchemist. Come on up. And I think he had an announcement he wanted to make. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, how great is this? 2018, I'll be sharing a stage with Dr. Patrick Byrne talking blockchain. Uh, I just want to say two things. And one of the reasons that we, so many of us are here today is that we owe a debt to this gentleman. Because a number of years ago, yeah. Let's hear it. A number of years ago when Bitcoin was not on CNBC and was ridiculed and we were all told we were crazy, we needed a face that brought credibility to the entire industry. And Dr. Patrick Byrne was the, the one who stepped up. Is the best you can come up, up with. <laughs> best you can. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to announce uh, some of the advisors um, 
on the project. And we at Alchemist are honored to be a part of this project. And we're honored to join some of these uh, illustrious names. So I'm just going to name them off. Uh, anybody, who, any of them that are here, feel free to stand up, do a flip. Uh, Brock Pierce, advisor. Uh, Matt Rozak, I think he's in here somewhere. You're here somewhere, Matt. I know you're here. Uh, Gil Pancina. And a Mr. Mo Levin, which everybody should be thankful today. Peter Diamantis. Jeff Pulver. Myself. Steve Nuriev. Thank you. And I saved the best for last. That's Mr. John Burbank. Come on Thank out, you. John. Thanks, Steve. All right, I realize we have uh, no time left. Um, I want to start by saying my biggest investment mistake last year was not coming to this conference. I really, I really, uh, I really wish I'd seen uh, the Ethereum presentation. Uh, Let me introduce, I'm sorry, I have to introduce John for just a second. John is a wonderful investor from Silicon Valley, very famous multi-billionaire investor who is, in my view, the most prescient guy in Silicon Valley on our whole space. Well, I just want to say two things. Number one, I'm a, I'm a global investor. I started Passport Capital 18 years ago, and I realized that markets really don't understand the future very well. And so I went to try to find out what were the big things that were going to change, because I didn't think markets would reflect it very well. And I've had a good career figuring those things out. The second, the second reason I'm here is as a fiduciary. I'm a fiduciary because um, because I represent investors in an SEC-compliant fund, and I have to follow all the rules and regulations of that, and it's not an easy task. Um, but this is coming. This is coming. And uh, I'm happy to announce today that Passport Capital and me as a fiduciary on behalf of my investors are investing $50 million into Overstock. Um, Thank you. And... And we believe, we believe the future is going to be meaningfully different than the way the markets price them. Um, and, uh, and we think um, we're way ahead of this curve. I wish I was here last year, but we're early. Uh, we're early, and we appreciate what you've done, Patrick. Um, apart from Wall Street, apart from uh, f f you've been mispriced for many years. Things are changing. Um, but we want to be on this journey with Patrick, and we're certainly going to be here for years to come at this conference. So thank you, Patrick. Thank you, John. Thank very, you very nice. Much.